Welcome to Uncaged from TalkSport. I'm Adam Catterall. It is a pleasure to be in your company and a pleasure to be in the company of my brand spanking new co-host for this show on a weekly basis, PFL's 2022 featherweight champion. Look at him there with his big smiley face, the one and only Mr. Brendan Lochnan. Look at this. Lovely you de be here. delving into the world of presenting now. Look at you, hey, lad. How are you? I told, hey, listen, I asked you for an opportunity and here we are, two banks going at it. Oh, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're obviously going to get stuck into UFC 300. Massive card coming up. Big centenary event uh, for the UFC in Las Vegas. We've got the light heavyweight championship on the line. We've got maybe two of the best female fighters going at it as well for a title. And the old BMF is being hauled back out with two of the baddest MFers on the planet uh, going at it too. And the card is stacked from top to bottom. When you've got two former world titleists kicking off the event in Cody Garbrandt and Davison Figueredo, you know full well that the card is is absolutely stacked. And we might get a little bit of inside information as well from Mr. Lochnane, uh, because he is training in a particular gym where some of these fighters are featuring on the mats. So he might be able to give us a little bit of an inside when we're making our picks a little bit later on. Um, regarding MMA and the UFC in general, Bren, can you remember the first time that you ever saw uh, the, the franchise, MMA, what was classed as cage fighting back in the day? Can you remember the first time you ever saw it? I remember the first time I seen it. I remember the first time I became a part of it. I remember going to watch my first fight. And I'm talking, smoking cigarettes in a sports hall, blowing it into the cage. I mean, we've come from the stone ages with mixed martial arts now. And we're talking about 25 years. We've watched it go from something that was massively frowned upon. I used to tell people I was a cage fighter. They used to walk away and like, oh, no way are you a cage fighter. To now... What, you're a cage fighter? What, you did that McGregor stuff? Wow, 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 wow. And everyone <laughs> wants to know your life story. Um, so we're getting there, and I feel like a show like this is perfect. Absolutely. Uh, UFC 300 is obviously coming up for us on April 13th. Um, but I want to quickly look at UFC 100 and UFC 200. I can't look back at UFC 100. I'm going to be dead honest. I know that a lot of people will look at it affectionately because it's a Brock Lesnar show. But the one that always sticks out for me, and I don't know where you're at with this, being a guy that we know very, very well in Michael Bisping, seeing him on the receiving end of that Hendo bomb, <laughs> the elbow that dropped down off the back of a fantastic Ultimate Fighter season, if you remember. Them two went back and forth. They were the main coach. They, they were the guys, mm -hmm. the coaches and they ended up fighting at UFC 100. Not the result that Bispin won, and one of the most brutal knockouts that you're ever likely to experience sure. in the UFC cage. Yeah, I mean, Adam, you just touched on it there. It was literally one of the most brutal ones I've ever seen. But guess what he did? He sucked it up and he came back and became a champion after that. So we can forgive that and we can forget that loss. So, yeah, we can skip that bit if you want, Adam. I don't mind skipping that. You know what I mean? Michael, Mike won't mind either. Yeah. <laughs> but Brock, I mean... Again, yeah. what we what we find with these with these big events, I mean, UFC 300 is a little bit different, and we'll get stuck into that in a minute. But 100 and 200 had that what you would class as crossover star power. Brock Lesnar, mm -hmm. the man from the WWE, coming in to the UFC and becoming the heavyweight champion. Again, bringing a different style of audience to MMA back then. Yeah, I mean, he came from WWE. It was quite unfortunate. If I, if I'm going to be honest with you, Adam, I found it quite unfortunate that somebody was able to walk in from the WWE and do that. I was like, come on, we're better than this, surely. Someone's just come from professional wrestling. Do you know what I mean? And walk straight to the top level of MMA. That could never happen again in this day and age. I truly believe that that couldn't happen again. So that, again, shows how far this sport has come since UFC 100. Absolutely. It has completely changed. But like yeah. back then, what you had is fighters that were brilliant in one particular discipline. Mm -hmm. I know it was called MMA, but it wasn't yeah. really mixed martial arts as we know right now. We're talking about guys and girls that have been on the mats for years yeah. training MMA. Whereas yeah. Brock, for example, was a collegiate wrestler. You've got guys and girls, we just spoke about Bisping, who were kickboxers originally and then learning other aspects of the game. And I suppose a little bit similar for you. You start with one particular discipline and now you're learning other disciplines and now you're a mixed martial artist. But the guys and girls that are starting now on the gyms they're starting as a, from a rounded base. So that's why the sport has moved on so much uh, from 100 to where we're at right now with 300. No, it's true. And again, touching on Brock Lesnar, I mean, he fought a guy in Frank Mir who mm. was well-rounded and could 
do everything. Do you know what I mean, Adam? And he did come in and do the business. So, again, I look at some of the other names on there. You've got George St. Pierre. He was well-rounded also. So 100 was kind of getting towards where that turning point was to the mixed martial artist. But when you go back before that, you talk about the graces. Then we are talking one-dimensional. We're talking about guys with one glove on. We're talking about guys coming in with geese on. And they were, you know, the original, they were the first days. 100 was kind of the tipping point. When I look at yeah. up and down that card and I look at some of the names, the Dan Hendersons, the Michael Bispings, um, but you are right, from 100 to 300 is an absolute astronomical difference. You've got kids now knocking about Manchester that are 10 years of age that would twist you up, grown men. They'll pull you down to the floor and they'll submit you like that. That shows how far this sport has come. My overriding memory of 200 is the gold cage floor, the gold mat. They changed everything on that particular day, didn't they? And of course, the big story is that it was supposed to be John Jones and Daniel Cormier, and we know what happened. Yeah. Jones pops up. He can't uh, uh, participate in the event. In steps Anderson Silva, and it became a little bit of a damp squib, that fight. Yeah, really, because it Because Daniel Cormier just, you know, lay and prayed him, ragdolled him a little bit. And Anderson Silva, who was never in that weight division, just couldn't really exist. But I suppose the superstar moment was Amanda Nunes. One of the best female fighters that we've, we've we've seen of a generation, taking it from Ronda Rousey to become this new 2.0 version of female fighters, and she absolutely did the business against Misha Tate. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I think 200 was quite disappointing when I look up and down the card. I think they could have done a little bit better with 200, if I'm honest, Adam. I mean, you know, it was that last-minute pull-out, and it was the Jones and Cormier thing that did dampen the card slightly. And bringing in Anderson Silva, who, let's have it right, was shouldn't have been in there, should he? Like, he just shouldn't. And I think, you know, I think 300 really is, it shows the levels between one, two, and three. And it's literally gone from okay to mediocre to 10 levels above both, up and down the card. Like you said, champions starting off the main card. Like, it's, it's brilliant. It really is. 100 and 200 felt like the attitude was we need that sprinkling of star power. I mean, Brock mm -hmm. featured on both of those 100 and 200s. John Jones was supposed to feature on yeah. 200. So it was one of those where you're trying to appeal to a certain audience. Whereas 300, even though I know it's come, come under a lot of criticism from fight fans mm -hmm. where they've gone, where's the star? Where's the star power? Yeah. I actually think the card's the star power. Because yeah. you look at the amount of fights that are on there, a ridiculous amount of contenders, guys that and girls that are ranked in all weight divisions in the top 10. Champions, former champions, it's stacked from top to bottom. And I actually think, as you've just mentioned there, as a card, it's it might be the best card that the UFC have ever put together. I mean, I'm just looking at the card now and it is an astronomical card, it really is. I mean, if we're going to start picking out a few of these fights, let's just start with the BMF. Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway. I mean, that alone, after just looking at that fight, I'm, my lips are salivating at the fact that them two men are going to fight for a BMF belt. I mean, that fight alone could headline any card ever and the whole world would tune in. You're talking about damage and excitement. Two very violent gentlemen who I'm very excited to see that one, Adam. Where, where, where are you at with Max stepping up to 155? You're a 145, eh? Max has yeah. made his career at 145. He's been the king at 145. I know he's fallen short recently, but he's going up to take on Justin Gaethje, who's one of the main players at 155. How do you feel about that weight jump for a fight of this magnitude? Well, it didn't go down very well last time he tried to do the jump, did it, Adam? I mean, it played against him, against Poirier. Uh, I just think it's, you know, we're not in boxing. It's not jumping up weights. It's not jumping up one pound, Adam. It's jumping up mm. 15 pounds. Uh, it's like these guys are built different, designed different. They've got bigger frames. Um, I've tried it myself and come up short, jumping up weights. It's not easy. Um, but there's a big but. If anyone could do it, it is Max Holloway. I am such a fan of that guy. I love his style. And that fight there, oh, again, I wouldn't want to be a better man. When you look at the last time he did it, he had a goal with Dustin Poirier. Poirier yeah. won that fight. Yeah. But Max was in it. Max took moments in that particular fight, even yep. as a smaller guy stepping in last minute to be able to do it. Now he's had a little bit more time maybe to 
you know, to fill out. I don't know whether he's done that or, or, yeah. or he's just had more time to prepare himself mentally for what's what's to come. The, the, the task of taking on Justin Gaethje, though, is very, very difficult because of where Gaethje's at. And when I look back to what Gaethje did with Raphael Fazeev in London last year, mm -hmm. I'm looking at an extremely talented mixed martial artist that just seems to be hitting his peak right at this moment. I think yeah. this, like you've, you've highlighted it as quite possibly the fight of the night. I think every single fan's thirsty for it to be fight of the night. From a Justin Gaethje point of view, Mike Soloway... He lost his first fight in the UFC via armbar. He's gone 27 without being finished. Okay, there's wow. losses on there, but 27 without being finished. If Justin Gaethje gets a finish against Max Holloway, that's a big statement. And do you think that propels him forward towards Islam Makachev and a shot at the 155-pound title? By the way, just touching on one of your previous points there, Rafael Fiziev is one of my main training partners and has been for about five years. And I'm telling you now... I was 100% certain that he was going to win against Justin Gates. I thought, there's no way striking's too clean. He's got... mm. Mate, I thought there is some levels in the UFC because this Rafael Fiziev is the best person I've ever been in the ring with. And that is a big, big statement, but it's the truth. And the way Justin Gates walks through his kicks and punches absolutely blew my mind. So, you know, that's a big... Thick, 155er, young, talented, over 150 kickboxing matches, punching and kicking you in the face at the highest level. Max Holloway has got to come up a weight, but I have met Max in person, so have you probably, and he's massive. He's not a small mm. guy. He's got the range, he's got the body for it, he's got. He's definitely got the Hawaiian heart for it. So that's what really excites me about this fight. And do you put him in for a title after? If there's anyone that deserves anything out of this sport, it's them two gentlemen in that fight. So I'd definitely put the winner in the, into a title shot for sure. Right. Well, that's going to lead me nicely to uh, bring in uh, Charles Oliveira and Armand Sarukian, who probably got yeah. eyes on the exact same thing, mate. Because, again, yeah. you spent a bit of time with Armand Sarukian. Uh, Charles Oliveira is one of my favourite fighters in the UFC. I mean, look same. at his, his record. He's so entertaining. It's either you or him. Most amount of submissions that the UFC has ever seen. He had a checkered start, 10 and 8, in his first 18 fights, and then he went on this crazy yeah, run to the title. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal human being, and I just think that this fight, it, for the purist, especially, I think there's going to be, a, I think it might be grapple heavy, if I'm dead honest, but I just yeah. think it's going to be a sensational knock. And again, two lads that if they come through it, could make a claim for having a shot at Islam Makachev. Yeah, but let me just touch on that 10 and 8, at featherweight, Adam, cutting 30, yes. 40 pounds, yeah? He finally thought, do you know what? I'm too big for this weight. Let's just stick at the weight that I should be. And look mm -hmm. what's happened since he did that. We've seen the real Charles Oliveira. Like, we've got the best version of him now that has decided to stop doing these drastic weight cuts. And having shared the ring with Tarukian as well, I know how good he is. Would I like to be a better man on this one again? Absolutely not. 50-50 fights, both of them. Um, wouldn't like to give you an answer on who's going to win either of them two. I really want Adam. Honestly, it's that close. That's what makes this 300 card so exciting. Just on Sarukian, just to explain to people watching this how good his aggressive, uh, offensive wrestling is. Because even when he's in situations where you think, oh, hang on a minute, his backside's at the mat here, he's in a bit of trouble, he seems to always be attacking. Well, let's be honest. He come in against Islam Makachev on short notice and nearly yeah. beat him. And yeah. nearly beat him. He was out grappling him in stages of that fight, looking world class. He was very young at the time. He's got a wealth of experience behind him now and he's fought everyone since then. And this fight here, Charles Oliveira, seems like he's in a very similar position. He's fought everyone. The both we've got the young hungry guy against Charles Oliveira, who's fought everyone and been around forever. Um, I do see it being very grapple heavy. It's the wrestler versus the jiu-jitsu. And it's going to be very interesting to see if Sarukian can keep himself out of these chokes and stuff. It really is. Before we carry on with the show, yes, I've got to make reference to me going full ball selector. My headphones are just packed in. First show, you'd have thought that I'd charge my headphones properly, mate, wouldn't you? You know what I mean? Uh, mate, mine just went as well. I can't say nothing. Sorry. <laughs> 
Listen, fascinating insight to Armand Sarukian and what he offers in that fight with Charles Oliveira. And we all know what Charles Oliveira can do. Even on his back, when he's in an awful amount of bother, he can still look to attack and take those chokes. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays because I actually think both of them being over-aggressive at tackling in the grappling exchanges could lead them into trouble. But from a fan point of view, that's a brilliant watch, isn't it, mate? Yeah, I mean, like you say, you've got the young bull who's given Islam his hardest fight in the UFC um, against Charles Oliveira, who's been around for absolute ever. I'm talking forever. I'm mm. sure he was on UFC 1 <laughs> at this point. Do you know what I mean? Uh, again, just to touch on that, we, we he's found his correct weight class. Ah, man, let me just tell you, is an absolute 155er. You yeah. want to see the size of this bloke, yeah? He's if back. I've ever seen a one, 155 athlete, it's him. You stare across him at UFC 300, you've got a heavy night on. Do you know what I mean? Because he's an absolute animal and he can do three five-minute rounds, no issue. Usually you see the bigger guys, they struggle a bit with the gas tank and he doesn't make full pelt, 15 minutes, no issue. We mentioned Gaethje and Holloway and obviously they'll class it as a title fight, the BMF title. This obviously got inaugurated when Jorge Masvidal took on Nate Diaz at uh, Madison Square Garden. It was fun. It was a little bit of a laugh. The Rock plastered the belt uh, on Jorge Masvidal that night. But since then, we've had a, we've had a couple where uh, Justin Gaethje obviously beat Dustin Poirier to become the second BMF. And now we've got this BMF title on the line. Where do you stand on BMF? Is it just a little bit of fun? Are you thinking to yourself, we don't need it. We know how good the blooming fight is. I mean, it's open to interpretation. Isn't it? Everyone's got their own opinion on it. Um, I don't know what to say because it's hard for me. I'm a proper fighter. I'm a fighter through and through. And that's just a made up belt that the rock give out from WWE. That I, I mean, <laughs> like, where does it stand? Do you get title money? Is it classed as a belt? Is there a weight class for it? Like, where do we go with it? Like, don't get me wrong. It's fun. And the Poriers and the Holloways and the Gaethje's, they are BMFs. Yeah. yeah. Like, let's not get it twisted. Yeah. These are BMFs. So if there's anyone that's in contention for them three letters, it's the men in question. But where do we go with it, Adam? Tell me, please. Yeah, it's just, for me, it's just a bit of fun, mate. It's a little bit of a trinket. It's a little bit of something to be able to sell maybe to that casual audience that we're all trying to attract and bring towards our sport. And as you've rightfully said, you can't have the BMF <laughs> title and then two <laughs> nice lads that don't you know, get stuck into it. You know full well that when you are referring to BMF, guys that are going to go that extra level, that extra mile, really put it all on the line. It doesn't get much better than Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway. So as a title, if I'm honest, I'm overly not fussed by it. Same. But I get it to be able to bring in that casual audience. I know full well that that fight's going to deliver. So I'm okay with it being monikered as a bad mf -er. All right. Well, let's agree on that one. And that fight definitely can never, ever fail. I know that for a fact, and I can't wait to see it. Okay. Now, let's get stuck into some prelims, shall we? Because as we said at the start of this, this card is stacked from top to bottom. Um, I'm fascinated by a boatload of this stuff. Davison Figueredo, Cody Garbrandt, is kicking off the whole show. It's the curtain jerker, mate. Two former world titles. You've got the guy that used to own the belt at Bantamweight. This is obviously taking place at Bantamweight against the guy that held the belt in the weight division below who's now stepped up in weight, who's got big aspirations, looked great in his first effort at Bantamweight, and Cody seems to have just got the mojo back in his last couple. Yeah. This is absolutely gigantic. From a name value point of view, yeah. if either one of these can deliver and deliver something spectacular, you never know, mate. They might be talking about world title aspirations at some point this year. It looked to me like Cody hit a bit of a point in his career where he's going through a few personal things. His head came off, the, his ball came off, the, his eye came off the ball for a second and he went through a few issues. It seems now that he's found his rhythm again, the old Cody that we've seen that beat Dominic Cruz and beat all these great guys. Seems like that guy's back now. Yeah. But he's also in with a very smooth operator, a very, very smooth operator indeed. Yes, he's coming up in weight, but shh. Should he have ever been at flyweight? Like, another gigantic bloke. We might see another Charles Oliveira situation where we actually see the best of him at 135. Mm. 
He was tight at 125, wasn't he, Davidson Ooh. Figueredo? And he was brilliant, don't get me wrong, but it just seems when you hit when you hit a certain age, like I think, what is he, 34, 35, 36 years of age, something like that, it gets tough to hit 125, man, doesn't it? Mate, when I say tight, I mean, that guy had nothing left on him, did he? Yeah. He, he might have been the biggest flyweight ever. Like, it's literally on the wire. Every time was, you know, you'd watch him struggling. The videos would come out of him struggling every time. Mm. And the main question that would be on everyone's mind every time he'd be booked was, is he going to make weight? That's when you know yeah. it's time to, you know, get up there. He's getting older in age. And like, you know, the younger weight divisions, the older you get, the harder it is to make. Um, so I think he made the right move. And what a great fight to start. You know what I mean? What a great fight to start the card. Yeah. Listen, there's loads to get stuck into. I want to get your opinion on Kayla Harrison because I know that you know her from, obviously, your time with her in the PFL. She's now made that step. She's in the UFC and she's taking on a legend that is a surefire Hall of Famer in Holly Holm. I mean, what an unbelievable debut. What a card to make your debut on. But do you think she's got a little bit of a point to prove? Olympic gold medalist, girl that's done it in a different organisation, now stepping into the UFC. Yeah, and I must say, what a very, very tough fight to start your UFC career with. You talk about Holly Holm. I mean, I might have been the only person on the planet back in the day that told everybody that Holly Holm was going to beat Ronda Rousey. Nobody believed me. Nobody saw and it. I was like, I was like, this girl's going to win. And everyone's like, oh, people just buy into hype and buy into stories and the narrative that the UFC played with Ronda. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa wait. From a martial arts perspective, she's going to win. And this fight here, two-time Olympic gold medalist, two-time PFL champion, wealth of experience mm. behind her, but you are stepping up big time. Like, it's a massive jump. Can Kayla do it? Absolutely. Who do I think is going to win? Not sure again. Another great 50-50 fight. But you talk about a world-class kickboxer against a world-class judoka and grappler. It's that typical striker versus grappler who can implement the game plan. Very similar, mate, to Aljamain Sterling's debut at featherweight. He's uh, moving up from 135, former champion there, to 145, taking on Calvin Cater, who's an elite-level striker. We know that Aljamain Sterling is an elite-level grappler. It's going to be really interesting to see how he fills out in that weight division. I mean, another guy that I've shared the ring with, done some rounds with, absolutely huge, huge for the weight. Absolutely no idea how he ever made 135. Another guy that's definitely made the right move and the right step up for his own health. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, Adam? Like, there's only so long you can do them drastic cuts. Great step up. Kelvin Cato might be the best boxer in the UFC. Definitely top three, you know? Max, Max gonna... Holloway might argue, mate. See, this when he, when, that time when he lit him up, didn't he? Blooming heck, what a fight that was. When he was telling him how to block and that. I know that was <laughs> Ortega, wasn't it? But yeah, you're right. But definitely top three. I love the way he sits behind the jab. Yeah, he's patient. Good. He's a great fighter. He's, he's another one that's got a point to prove. Um, tough step up, tough debut at featherweight, Kelvin K. It really is. It's a really tough first matchup. But I do think we could actually see the best Al Jermaine at 145. I genuinely believe that. On your travels, have you ever come across Yuri Prohachka? I have. Trains at Bang Tower as well. Never trained with him. Never actually shared the actual map of him, but seen him around the gym plenty of times. What an intense guy, man. What is a, it? he is, Samurai up to the max, that fella, isn't he? Lovely, don't get me wrong, really Just calm, really drink. peaceful, uh, but jeez, man. He lives, when you say, give me a fighter that lives the life, this guy lives it, eats there. it, breathes it, he's doing the whole nine yards, my man. And it's interesting to see him in this fight with Alexander Rakic as well at UFC 300. You know what, Rakic, I've just seen a video of Rakic on the pads. He looks very tasty at the minute. I, do. I was watching it thinking, you know when like you're flicking for Instagram and you just see someone really good and you like, and then I've seen who it actually was. I thought, wow, that's tasty. Jiri pulls it out the bag. Very, very exciting fight. How delighted are you? Seeing as that we were at the start of this show talking about the centenary events, UFC 100, UFC 200, UFC 300. The common denominator in all those three events is the one and only Jim Miller. Look at that career, man. Been there, done it, got the T-shirt, been in the UFC for time, and now he gets an opportunity to fight on the third Centurion event like he did at 100 and 200. Yeah, but can we also take a hat off to Bobby Green? What a legend. <laughs> what a legend to put him in the ring with. Like, 
Think of anyone else in the world you could have put Jim Miller in with. Is that not the perfect fight? Yeah. I'm right. actually I'm actually disappointed that they've not put BMF on this fight. This is yeah. a BMF fight, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, how many years? I mean, how long's his career been? Twenty years, twenty five years, something like that. I mean, it's absolutely insane to be fighting the highest level of MMA for that long. He has fought absolutely everyone. And do you know what, Adam? He's kept stum. You don't see him running around, parading around, making a fool of himself, yeah. trying to sell himself. He just gets in there. He's your typical blue collar worker, gets in there, gets his job done, and massive respect for that man and his family and what they've had to put up with being in the UFC for that long. Absolutely, mate. <laughs> absolutely. Right, let's make some predictions, shall we? I know that you know some of these geezers, so it might put you in a little bit of a compromising position. It's probably going to put me in a compromising position as well, <laughs> seeing as that I'm going to interview him during UFC 300, so they're oh, all going to come at me God, saying, Oi, oh, you, you've picked such and such a body. Uh, Let's start. Let's go from the bottom right to the top, man. We've got Davison Figueredo, who has made that step up, looked brilliant last time out, and he's taking on Cody Garbrandt, who seems to have got his mojo back. I'll go first if you want, mate, right? Because I spent a bit oh. of time at the PI last week watching a few guys training. Cody trains there a lot. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going to be dead honest with the audience here. I do have an affection for Cody Garbrandt. I absolutely love the lad. And... I, I'm willing him on. I'm willing him to yeah, have yeah. that resurgence because he came young, became champ, great performance against Dom Cruz, mate of yours, and it just fell off for him. Now it seems to have clicked again. I think this is a massive, massive moment in his career. And if he can deliver one of those Cody Garbrandt bombs, you just never know what might come next. So I'm going to side with Cody Garbrandt, but it's not massively confident because Figueredo is so well-rounded. He is the business. Do you know what? I'm going to 100% agree with you on everything you just said. I feel like Cody's been at 135 much longer. He's been a champion at that weight. He's found his mojo again. He's looking back in form. Is it going to be easy? Absolutely not. But I do think Cody gets it done. Okay. Where well, are you going with Bobby Green and Jim Miller then, my man? The fans win this one. The fans, <laughs> Adam. The fans. Get them splitters out your backside. Where are you going? Come uh, on. Um... <laughs> It's so tough Jim to Miller. pick. It's tough to Jim pick. Miller. Yeah. Jim I think, Miller. I think anybody making a pick, you've got to go with nostalgia. You've got to go with emotion on this. Don't get me Is wrong. Is there any justice in the world? Listen, I love Bobby Green. I think he's an absolute gangster. But yeah, Jim Miller has to get his hand raised at UFC Please. 300. Please. Um, I think it'd be a tremendous fight. Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison. Do you know something? I'm going to go against something here because I, I, I know that the favourite is going to be Holly. She's been here for a long period of time. I just think that Kayla Harrison, given the narrative coming into this, given yeah. um, the stylistic matchup of it, I mean, she's a sensational grappler. When, when an elite um, striker matches up with an elite grappler to the level that we're talking about, a two-time Olympic gold medalist, I yeah, just yeah. think that she's going to find a way to be able to do it. And the noise in and around her this week, I think it's a really good matchup for her. I'm going to side with Kayla Harrison to come through against Holly Holm, who is an absolute surefire Hall of Famer but I think yeah. Kayla might just be too much for her on the night. Yeah, I agree with that. Asia isn't really on Holly's side anymore. You know, I was uh, referring to a, a Ronda Rousey fight in Australia. How many years ago was that? Yeah. You know, and she's still knocking about. Kayla's been incredibly active. She's a winner, Adam. She knows how to win two Olympic gold medals, two PFL belts. This woman knows how to win fights, and I agree with you on that, Kayla Harrison. I'm interested to get your take on this because you know your elite striking. So Calvin Cater, will he have too much for Aljamain Sterling stepping up in weight? Or will the man that you've shared a mat with be able to show off that uh, elite grappling that he's got? I'm going to go Aljamain Sterling. I really am. I've just seen recent videos of him grappling. He looks big and strong for the weight. And I feel like once he gets you down, he's a real nightmare. And I think he can overwhelm Kelvin on the fence, take him down and just ride it out like he does. Yeah. Well, he's going to... Like he does. I think anybody that's watching Algebra like Sterling fight just knows. Like he does. Yiri Pahachka against uh, Alexander Rakic is such an interesting matchup because Yiri Pahachka is obviously coming off the back of the loss last time out to Alex Pereira. He looked slightly lost in that fight, which was highly concerning. He's coming off the back of that massive shoulder injury. He'd been out for a long period of time. I don't know where he's at. And Alexander Rakic just, seem, it just seems to start... It seems to be going for him now. I know that he's had a couple of losses along the way, but Rakic seems to be in some mm. nice rhythm. I'm going to, with it being a 15-minute fight, I don't think there's going to be a stoppage, but I think Rakic will get it done on points. 
Yeah, just like I was referring to before, I, I was flicking through Instagram, seeing this unbelievably sharp gentleman, and it was Alexander Rakic. And I feel like he's in his groove. This is his time. He's on the rise, and I feel like this is his moment, and he'll definitely get. I think you know I'm very confident in that one. I really do think that's the most confident I am in most in and out of any of these fights on this card. Rakic. Uh, Bo Nichols taking on Cody Brundage. Um, obviously, there's a lot of noise behind uh, Bo Nickel. We know his pedigree. He's uh, on the main card. How do you see this one going? How can you look anywhere else apart from Bo Nickel in this fight? I mean, how, like, tell me, Adam, please. I don't. I don't. That's why I've just I've crossed it in for you, mate. Just tap that in because I think because <laughs> <laughs> I think Bo Nickel. We're only going to find out about Bo Nickel when he's fighting top fivers, I think. Yeah. Um, and yeah. with all due respect to Cody Brundage, I think this is an opponent that Bo Nickel can look really good against at UFC 300 and claim a little bit of the pomp from the fans where they go, who the hell is that guy? Yeah, I agree. Bo Nickel, definitely. I want to see him with you know the, the elites of the elites now. But I, I get it. I've got the same manager as him and I think my manager's doing the right thing and he's slowly building, building him up. To, yeah, and they're doing the right thing. They're taking the time with Bo. Um but, I mean, yeah, we want to see the elites now, don't we, Alan? Yeah. Charles Oliveira, Armin Sarukian. Over to you, my friend, because this is brilliant. And this is so I'm hard gonna, to pick, so hard. I'm going to go Armin Sarukian because I don't want to be walking around Tiger getting attacked by him. <laughs> so I'm going to say Armin Sarukian. I'm going to go Charles Oliveira because he's on my schedule to interview and Armin Sarukian isn't. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> So there we go. Hey, we've been forced our hands on this. There one, you go. We both say. bottled it. We both bottled yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we did. Listen, no. both elite. It's going to be such a great fight, that. Uh, Charles Oliveira versus Ovin Sarukian. The BMF <laughs> title fight, Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. Do you know something? If I wouldn't have seen Justin Gaethje do what he did to Rafael Faziv, I would probably have maybe a different opinion on this fight. But the guy is just hitting his straps right now. And I'm going to side with Justin Gaethje. The mad thing about this is that, yes, it's not what we would class as a proper title fight, but it is 25 minutes. Yeah. I think it's going all the way because nobody finishes Max all the way. It's just the way it is, man. It just, it just, mean, does, listen, just doesn't happen. They're both 25-minute gladiators, aren't they? Both of them got cardio for days. Mm. Both of them don't take a back step. Amazing fight, but I've got to go with you on that. Like I said about Fiziev. Oh. Best striker I've ever, ever been across from. And the way he dealt with that, I feel comfortable in saying that he can also deal with Holloway in the same manner. Yeah. I think Max might have moments though late because Max is one of them that starts slow and then just rises into fights, doesn't he? It's going to be brilliant. Once we hit championship rounds in that fight, that's when it's going to go right off. It's going to be Listen, brilliant. that's not the fight to go to the toilet on. Put it that way. <laughs> Make sure you're well and, well and truly awake. Um, I'm a massive fan of Jingwei Li. I think right now she's the best female fighter on the planet. She's taking on, obviously, a fellow countrywoman in Yan Xiaonan. Um, Yan's been brilliant recently, and she's absolutely earned her shot at her title. But again, I was in the PI last week. I'm watching Jingwei Li train, mate. It's different level stuff. She, she's the best female fighter on the planet right now, and I can't see Xiaonan stopping that train at UFC 300. Another one that trains at Bang Time, mate. Probably, no joke, Adam, the hardest trainer I've ever come across. She Unbelievable. There all day. All day and all night. She has a full team to stood around her. She is an incredible workhorse. So much respect for her and agreed. I think she gets it done too. I really do. Right. Big lads. Ta fight. It's the title fight. Light heavyweights. Alex Pereira, Jamal Hill. Where you at? How can you ever write off Alex Pereira? Like, how can you ever, 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 ever? How can you not be a fan of that man and his style and what he's done in the sport in such a short period of time? And I think he just blasts him out of there. I do. I just, I've got this feeling. What are you saying? I think that the rust on Jamal Hill because of that injury, he had a bad injury with his Achilles yeah. snapping and all that. He's been out for a long time. This is his first fight back, straight back in. And it, it, listen, it, it's well warranted because he was the champion. He vacated the belt so the division could move along. So he's well within his rights to be here. I just think it's the activity of Pereira, the level that he's been beating, yeah. the way that he, the power, man, the power on that left hook. And he, he he's not like, he doesn't telegraph it. 
he sets it, he sets it, he sets it, he sets it, and then he detonates it. And I just think, yeah. like you've said, the style of Jamal Hill, with him being that guy that likes to get on the inside and brawl a little bit, yeah. he's going to yeah. walk onto one. And I can't see it going more than 10 minutes, I'll be honest, mate. Pereira will find the chin within 10 minutes. Jamal Hill's a dog, and he'll absolutely try his best to stay in there for as long as he can. Mm. But Pereira will find a way. I mean, 100% agree with you. The way, the way he's dealt with Izzy striking over the oh. last couple of fights, I mean... You know, nobody's been able to do that in the UFC this far. So the way he's done it and the way he's navigated through it and the way he's found his shots, amazing calf kicks and the best left hook in the whole of MMA, he really is. It's crazy. And I, I think with Jamal coming off that injury, liking to be a pocket fighter, probably the worst guy you want to be in a pocket with. Um, yeah, Alex Pereira, 100%. That's the one with. The flip of it, though, is that Izzy did knock Pereira out in the pocket by backing himself, didn't he? That he, is true. That, he stayed uh, in what, there. He caught He caught that left and then went. As soon as he caught that left, he just went, didn't he? And I suppose that's what Jamal Hill's got to do. A good point. Yeah, yeah, that's what makes it super interesting. It really does. Oh, mate. Right. Out of all them, give me your fight of the night. Where are you going? You can only pick one. There's 12 belters. Which one are you having? Absolutely easiest decision of my life. Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. Easy. Yeah, you're probably right, mate. You're probably right. Easy. There will be a bonus, though, in the Charles Oliveira Armand Sarukin fight. There will be a bonus in that. Might be a performance bonus, that one. But I think yeah. your fight of the night is going to be Gaethje versus Holloway. Good man. Is it five rounds, by the way? No. Yeah. Oh, the a BMF, you're right. Yeah, it is. 25 minutes of carnage, mate. How about a mid card five rounder? How about that? Brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> Everyone's in for a treat. Can't wait. Yeah. Uh, listen, that was Uncaged by Talk Sport. I've been Adam Catterall. He's been Brendan Lochnane. Don't forget that this man is training for a fight. April 19th, Chicago. Back on the PFL. The featherweight season kicks off. Obviously, we're going to be documenting that as he gets closer to fight night. But every single Sunday after the big events, we're going to be sat here previewing and reviewing. It's going to be an interesting chat next week, mate. After... Uh, all this has, uh, has played out. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel right here as this channel grows uh, on TalkSport. Make sure you get stuck into that. And of course, uh, make sure you're tuning into TalkSport throughout the course of the week for all your latest MMA news.